you know, Bob, it's not quite a recession, but they come up with some pretty good lines out there. And the one that I found that was kind of funny, but kind of true is, is vibe session, meaning, you know, we're not necessarily in a recession, but because inflation was so high, um, in a lot of cases outpaced wages, the vibe out there just like, isn't that great? <laughs> yeah. You know, it's interesting. I just, uh, I just spoke to, you know, one of our clients yesterday, um, just had a procedure in the hospital and he's doing well, everything went, went great. And he's like, no, Bob, what are, what are people thinking out there? Are people getting really greedy or people fearful? And I said, man, it's like, it's, it's like the borderline, right? There's some people who are, who are getting greedy. You want to know why they don't have all their money in lamb research or, you know, or uh, NVIDIA or one of these tech stocks. Um, suddenly they want to speculate in tech stocks. And then you have the other side that thinks like 50% of the people in this country think we're in a recession right now. Yeah, which is kind of wild because we've had seven quarters of growth. So it's not like, you know, we've, we've had a big dip here uh, in the last two years, which is kind of interesting, but that's kind of where the sentiment is. And I like the fact you use borderline, Bob. I know you've been listening to old Madonna. <laughs> <laughs> I suspect that's where you got that line from. That's all my playlist. Um, he pushing interest rates over the borderline. I think we could, we could change the, the lyrics to that song. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is, it is interesting because, I mean, from an economic perspective, you just look at the numbers, not emotionally, uh, things are still pretty good, right? We're still tracking for close to 2% growth in the second quarter. We know earnings were really good for the first quarter. They were solid. They're going to accelerate throughout the summer. Um, we're seeing a lot of moderation out there, right? Manufacturing numbers are still not great, which means that, you know, we're not seeing any inflation in goods. And at the same time, you know, we're starting to see some cooling in the job market. And if you look at wage inflation, it's still moderating as well. So it's like, it's not a bad time. If you look at the numbers, but we start measuring people's emotions right now, uh, you're not getting a real high rating. Yeah, but you know, right? I mean, you got to read the newspaper too, or, or at least you know, <laughs> turn on your computer. These same people who feel like we're in a recession think that unemployment, it's an all-time record high. We're at an all-time record low. <laughs> uh, they think the stock market is down for the year. I mean, this is an everything rally. Everything is up for the year. I, I can't think of anything that's actually down for the year. Uh, maybe real yeah. estate's about it, right? Yeah. Um, so it, it's, you know, I, I think you, you can't just go totally on emotions, but people do, right? I mean, it's, it's been going on in, uh, in the markets for generations, right? That people make decisions based on their gut. Yeah. They don't use their brain, right? <laughs> they use their gut. You can almost argue in general, maybe as you know, human behavior goes, maybe we do veer a little more on the negative side in general, right? I mean, that's probably just a quirk of being human is, you know, we're always back to caveman times. You always have to watch your back. <laughs> your head should always be on a swivel. Um, and I think maybe that's part of it as well. But, you know, the other funny thing is, psychologically speaking, when Americans feel good or they feel bad, they still spend money. Yeah, they do. <laughs> because we're not feeling good. You go out and you buy stuff and it has a dopamine uh, you know, effect on your brain. And so I would almost ignore the sentiment surveys here. Watch what people do, not what they say and feel. Yeah, that's very true. But you know, that, it doesn't change human nature. Investors always want to chase what's popular and invest what's up because they know it's good. Look how much it's going up. And they like to sell what's down. They go, look how bad it is. Look how much it's going down, right? I mean, every board I've served on an, on an investment committee, you know, even the professionals who are on the boards trying to help the institution or the charity, they're always dumping the manager after three years of, of non-performance and chasing something based yeah. on a good three-year track record. But, you know, it's hard. It, you know, look, investing's hard, right? And let's just take inflation. The Fed's talking about an inflation target. What does that mean? I mean, how long does it have to be at that target? When is that target supposed to be met? I mean, how committed are they to it? Or is it just words that they spew just to, you know, give the writer something to write about? Yeah, no, I think you're right about that. And, and for us to predicate our whole investment strategy on what the Fed's going to do next is crazy. But if you watch financial news, that's how you feel right now. Um, like everything's going to be predicated on what Jerome Powell says next week and how he reads the tea leaves. But at the end of the day, I mean, if you look at the economy in general, it's just not as rate sensitive as it used to be, right? We're a service-based economy now. We used to be more of a good-based economy. And when we were a good-based economy, then manufacturing, and it was more capital intensive. So more borrowing had to be done at higher interest rates. But now in this new, new economy where we're more service-based, uh, we're more software-based, interest rates don't matter as much. You don't need to borrow as much money. Like look at Apple right now. I mean, they literally sit on like $160 billion right now in cash. 
they don't need to borrow money, even if the, you know rates now are at like five, six, or seven percent. It doesn't affect them one bit. Well, so what's this inverted yield curve telling us, right? It's been inverted now for the longest period in history. It's at 20 months, almost two years. Um, and you know, historically, when they did invert the yield curve, it did have a negative impact on the financial system. But you know, banks right now, they're not paying 5.37% on, on the cash that's deposited with them. You know, the average interest rate that a bank's paying right now is like a half of 1%. And they're lending, right? Business loans are about 8 to 10% right now. And what are mortgages, right? 7, 7, 8%? Yeah, they're about so 7%. So banks are minting money right now. Financial system's minting money right now with this inverted yield curve. All right. So well, I want to buy bank stocks, note to self. It's a good point. You know, I think the other wild ride, obviously, and we talk about this probably at nauseum now because every week it just keeps going up. NVIDIA now is up like 150% for the year. <laughs> um, you know, investors just can't get enough of this stock. I mean, semiconductor stocks in general have rallied big right now. But you sent out the craziest stat this week, and it blew my mind. And I guess from Sequoia, they're, they're a private equity firm, and they have a stat that you had about $50 billion spent on artificial intelligence last year, yet companies only saw about three billion in revenue from all their AI endeavors. There's got to be a disconnect here, Bob. You know, I feel like this hype. There's got to be something wrong here. <laughs> AI can't be changing everything, and monetarily, it clearly isn't. Should we not believe the hype here? Well, I'd say, look, it's a momentum stock du jour. So, you know, <clears throat> at some point, it'll change, and everybody will say, "Oh, I remember that guy Ryan talking about." You know how this could happen. I mean, seriously, a company that makes a GPU, nobody else is going to be able to create a GPU, uh, advanced micro devices, Intel. Uh, you know, so you, you don't. There's there's a lot of things that you that you don't know, and the market's forward looking. So maybe AI is going to generate enormous revenue, but people are spending a lot of money on it right now. But meanwhile, you know, you look at the rest of the of the stock market, right? You've got 160 companies that are growing their revenue at 25 percent a year. You don't have to be a semiconductor cyclical stock, you know, to be having great growth right now in a profit, uh, you know, we're in a profit cycle to the upside. Yeah, no, we are. And globally right now, if you look at pretty much every European market in the world is at a record high right now, they just cut interest rates in Europe. Uh, so they're ahead of the curve on cutting rates from where we are in the U.S. Inflation is much lower there. Valuations on their stocks are much lower. You're getting really sweet dividends right now to own international companies. So there's so many places to put your money. I know we talk about this each week too. It's just like something we just can't kind of bang the drum on. But most investors, we see your portfolios every week. You're still missing the boat on that. Well, you know, I love the fact that we have a uh, real estate market that's going through the roof. We had a lot of questions about that. I've had a lot of discussions because, you know, a lot of our clients have children who are trying to buy a home. Every time they go to make an offer, you know, the, ho the house they're looking to make an offer on is already sold. Uh, so there's obviously been a shortage of houses. And meanwhile, the prices are going up like crazy. Now, you know, I've transferred the flag from Naples to Ocean City for the summer. And, and I'm talking to a lot of my buddies who own investment properties down in the islands here. And they said, oh, their rentals are down. You know, they're down big from last year. And meanwhile, prices are at all time high. Affordability is at an all time low. Something's got to give here, right? What do you think? Yeah, I think you're right. But I think there is a floor under the real estate market because at the end of the day, if you look at baby boomers, 80% of you own homes, good for you, round of applause. Uh, but for millennials, it's more like something like 50%. So clearly there's still a lot of younger people out there that don't own homes. Um, but to your point, Bob, like you're going to have to see something give on the prices here. I think you're dead right about that. But I don't think you're going into some sort of like huge real estate crisis like we saw back during the great financial crisis back in like 2008, 2009. But I think things are a little frothy here. And that's probably where the Fed is actually making some headway, right? By raising interest rates as high as they have, at some point it should bring prices back down and maybe cool off the economy a little bit. That's what the Fed wants. If we get that and we get an interest rate cut this year at some point, man, oh man, Bob, things would get wild. This market would go up a lot higher. Well, you know, in real estate, though, right, there's a bit of speculation. There's, a, I think, a little bit of overbuilding going down in Florida, down uh, both on east, both coasts. Uh, I think there's a little bit of overbuilding and a lot of speculation. I think there's a lot of overbuilding going on, you know, at the Jersey Shore and other resort areas. And if people are depending on their rental income and that's not coming in, um, you could have a lot of my fellow baby boomers start to sell and downsize. I'm telling you, beware the silver tsunami. It might be coming.
Hey, hope you're enjoying episode 153, Pain Points of Wealth. Everything you hear on this podcast, along with some due diligence of your own, can help you get ahead financially, literally at any stage of your journey. But if you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan, and you want a more hands-on approach, Bob, Chris, and I now have a collective 75 years helping individuals just like you with your planning and investing. This is what we do every single day. We'll put together for you a total financial master plan. We'll do a bird's eye view of your entire financial life and hone in on every financial issue you need to address today. There's not a firm out there that will do this work up front. In fact, we'll build you your own personalized financial portal. We'll go through and look at everything you need from an income plan for retirement. How do you draw from your portfolio? How do you take social security? We'll do a full deep dive of your total portfolio. Look at your diversification. Have you had way too much money in the market? Have you seen your portfolio go up and down like a yo-yo? Or have you been sitting in cash, paralysis by analysis, can't figure out what to do? We'll put together a full investment game plan. We'll show you how to grow your wealth, tie it to your goals, but most importantly, protect it over the rest of your life. And we'll look at fees and taxes. Wall Street loves to sell you high cost, tax inefficient products, whether it's an annuity, insurance product, structured product, brokerage product. We'll do a deep dive of all those investments, show you how to reduce the cost and optimize your portfolio for taxes. It's now what you make. It's what you take. You'll get a full tax playbook. If you saved over a million dollars for your financial independence plan, simply go to www.paincm.com slash financial plan or click on the link below to see if you qualify for a free financial review. All right, it's a tipping point. This is where we pinpoint the pain point. Of course, that's P-A-Y-N-E. Having the biggest impact on your wealth right now. And Aaron, thanks for joining us today, man. And, you know, I thought we'd go a little old school. You know, back in the day, we used to actually dissect someone's actual financial plan and go through it and talk about maybe the flaws or what they could be doing better to be on their track financial independence. I know, Aaron, you worked on a case recently. You know, why don't you give us the rundown? We could talk about, you know, some of the different things that you were able to do to help this couple get on their path to financial independence. Sure. Well, it's great to be here, Ryan, Bob. Thanks for having me. Um, so in this case, I was working with a couple in their 70s, retired, uh, had Social Security, they had pensions, and they're working with an advisor that really they really just wanted a second opinion. Uh, what we found was that in their mid-70s, really, they didn't need a lot of risk or growth at all in the portfolio. They were 70% in the market. Um, and of that, you know, about 30% was concentrated just in large caps, just in wow. the S&P 500. I know Bob's shocked right now. Bob doesn't <laughs> know what to say. He's speechless. But you know what? We're seeing a lot of that right now because the market's really hot and people really want to capture the upside and they forget, guess what? Markets go down too. And when you're 70, it's really no fun when the market actually finally goes down. Yeah, it's, uh, it's a rude awakening. Thankfully, it's been a while since we've had, you know, an extended bear market like the great financial crisis. But that, you know, we've seen it can really be, be debilitating to somebody's portfolio. Um, and the other thing with this couple is they were paying almost one and a half percent between their advisory fees and the cost of the funds that they were in. Um, so that, that's really another red flag that I think just a lot of people don't even know where to look or don't, don't pay attention. Uh, and they're really shocked when they see something like that. Well, you know, a lot of times, Aaron, it's a conflict of interest with the, their advisor. They're, you know, many times in the past I've had, you know, new, new clients, people on boarded and they left their old advisor because the old advisor didn't believe in owning bonds because, you know, Warren Buffett didn't own bonds. I mean, like that was their rationale or, you know, they just, uh, they were 40 years old. And they said, why, why would I want to own bonds? Well, their client's 85 or, you know, or 80. <laughs> it's like, you know, they apply the same standard. So it's, um, you know, and, and, and look, when something, when the market's moving in one direction, you think it's always going to go in that same direction. That's why I think it's great to have that one report that we run that, that shows you what would have happened to your portfolio had you been invested the way you are today <laughs> and the decline like we had in, in, you know, 2000, 2008. Yeah. I mean, people always forget, guess what? It wasn't that many years ago that the S&P 500 went down like 60%. <laughs> you know, the great financial crisis wasn't that long ago. I still have scars on my back. Um, and you're starting to see that mentality uh, seep in a little bit. I was speaking to a woman the other day, reviewed her portfolio, you know, like 100% in the market. Everything's in growth. <laughs> you know, things like, I think Amazon's your number one position. And she said, you know, I can handle a sell-off. I don't mind being more aggressive. If my portfolio goes down 10%, hmm. yeah, I'm good with that. And I'm thinking 10%, a portfolio like this, literally in a bad market, go down like 70%, 80%. And she had no clue. And I think that's the problem right now is most of us don't realize the underlying risk in our portfolio. 
because like when the tide's in, um, you know, you don't know who's swimming naked kind of paraphrase Warren Buffett. And I think that's one of the bigger mistakes we're going to see a lot of people make right now because things are going so well. You know, one of the things that we see all the time is people don't realize what they need to retire and to reach their goals. You know, this is a perfect example of a couple that we met with. It's like, hey, guys, you really don't need to be taking a lot of risk at all. Uh, to leave, you know, a couple million dollars in the portfolio at your age is 90 or your your age is 100. Why are we putting all this risk on the table and potentially, you know, potentially putting you back to work in your 70s? Well, you know what, Aaron, the nice thing about having gray hair and scar tissue in my stomach lining is I've seen it all before. Um, have you had a client in the last 10 years bragged you about their largest position being GE? Or has anyone bragged to you about, oh, my God, you can't believe it. I have all my money in a company called Cisco. Um, and, you know, we went through a period of time, which is now the, you know, the Amazon period now or the Apple period or the, you know, the uh, NVIDIA period where, you know, this is the same conversation I want to have. Well, why would I ever want to take any money out of GE? It's the greatest stock ever. Well, it didn't go up for 20 years after, it, you know, it had uh, Cisco, greatest company ever. Why would I want to buy anything else? Well, still hasn't gotten back to where it was 20 years ago. Um, so it's just, it's amazing, you know, that the markets repeat, but investors never learn. They just don't seem to learn. Well, that's a great point too, because I think the big question now is like, let's just say you bought NVIDIA and you're up like hundreds of percent on that stock. And the same woman I was speaking to, I was just like, this conversation really drove me mad. <laughs> she said, well, you know what? You know, there's a lot of people, they'll know when to get out ahead of time. I know there's some insiders that'll be able to read the tea leaves and get me out before the stock goes down. I'm like, <laughs> good luck with that. <laughs> good luck with that. Hey, um, that's right. Like, her, favorite, her favorite movie is Wall Street, right? I don't want you <laughs> giving me information. I want you getting me information. I want you to be illegally providing me insider information. <laughs> but, but the other thing is too, you can get out early, right? If you would have gone out Cisco even like a year or two before or three years before the stock declined, you would have made it out better than riding it all the way down. And I think that's the, the bigger message here is no one knows when the party's going to stop. If, you know, if I did, I'd be on my yacht. <laughs> um, and since you don't know when the party's going to stop, the best thing you can do is be proactive, not reactive. And it's okay to be early. Um, you just don't want to be late. And I think that's, again, the big mistake that we're seeing with a lot of portfolios right now is people don't understand the underlying risk. And man, oh man, when parts of the market sell off, if you weren't already proactive about that, you know, you're going to put yourself into really harm's way when it comes to your financial life. You know, it's even, it's even more simple than that. Um, why do people speculate in individual stocks, right? What's the dream? I'm going to double my money. Well, if you invest in a diversified portfolio <laughs> that generates just an average market return, you're basically going to double your money every 10 or 12 years. Now, people who invested in Cisco and GE and all the other hot stocks, Intel, you know, they haven't doubled their money. They're probably at half the money they invested. Uh, if they had a regular diversified portfolio, they'd have doubled and tripled their money. Um, so it's just, it's, it's so ludicrous. Like, why do people think they have to go out and gamble um, as opposed to invest? I guess it's more exciting, Bob. I don't, I don't know what to tell you, man, but I, I tell so many people, you hit the lottery, cash out, diversify. Because it's great that you just made a couple hundred thousand or whatever it is. You doubled your money in a year or two. You're not going to love it, you know, in two to five years when now you cut your, your money's cut in half. Cash out. Yeah. Like, and if you don't need the risk, it was, you have hit the lotto, right? Like, and I saw in this portfolio here, I saw the analysis that you ran. It's like, we're taking less risk. You can increase the income on the portfolio by like $25,000 a year. And that's consistent income that comes in that's not predicated on, Oh my God, is the market going to go up this year? Is it going to go down? Can we predict the future and tell you what you're going to do? With I mean, it's just like crazy um, where you can really, you know, in a place where, let's face it, um, there's a lot you can't control in the stock market. Um, in a diversified portfolio, you can control the income to some extent and you can make it very consistent. And when you're building financial independence, that's what you want. You want a consistent income stream. And most of us don't focus on that when we're building our financial independence plan, but it's so critical. You know, guys, years ago, um, when I was in one of the other bubbles, <laughs> not saying there's a bubble now, but uh, we had a statement at the firm I worked for where they would put the total value of your portfolio in big, bold numbers at the very top of the statement. <clears throat> and so when you get into these periods where people don't really start to understand, they don't fully comprehend the stress related to losing half your money on paper. All right, so I would just take this 
<clears throat> red leaky felt pen and I would cross out their $10 million number on the top of their statement and I'd write down 5 million. And they go, what's that? I said, well, that's your portfolio. If I execute all of your speculative ideas <laughs> and we have a natural correction somewhere in the next 10 years, how do you feel? <clears throat> I lost half my money. I said, yeah, but you'll stay invested and recover it, right? You won't get depressed. You won't be upset that you've lost 5 million. You're going to stay in the market for another 10 years to get it back. And of course, you know, people say, oh yeah, I'll be brave. And I'm like, no, you won't. <laughs> so, yeah. so I think that report showing people what can happen, you know, when you hit that inevitable correction and the stress that's involved, you know, the actual stress that's involved when you see you're losing money on paper, um, you know, you know what happens? They always make it permanent by acting, you know, when they're at the, down the most is when you act. I really like the old school Bob red pen method. <laughs> Nobody <don't> use that. <laughs> yeah. I used to have a lot of dinks back then, right? You know, dual income, <laughs> no kids. Hey, you know, let's roll the dice. We're 45. We're making a ton of money. We don't need to, you don't need to worry about risk. Yeah. Forget AI and all these fancy new spreadsheets we use. You know, Bob just like took that piece of paper, got that red pen, show people what's going to happen. I love it. What? It's an effective tool. <laughs> All right, it's the hidden facts of finance, random financial facts that may surprise you or even shock you. All right, Bob, a record 22.3 million Americans are employed in healthcare, social assistance, 17 million in leisure and hospitality, another 23 million that work in government, mostly state and local. In contrast, all good producing industries combined employ just 22 million people, constituting only 10% of payroll employment which used to be 30% back in, 19, in the 1950s, we clearly have gone to a service economy from a manufacturing economy. It's kind of remarkable how much it's changed over the last uh, 50 years or so. Yeah, it truly is remarkable, Ryan. And, and you see the amount of employment in healthcare and you see the amount of employment in service industries because my, my generation of baby boomers, we're, we're enjoying a wealth that we've created. We're spending it on healthcare because we have a lot of ailments. Every day I get up, I hear it snap, crackle, and pop, and it's not my Rice Krispies. It's my body. Um, but, we, but we go out and dine. My friends, they go out to dinner. Nobody cooks. Nobody stays home and cooks anymore. So they, you, know, you got a lot of people going out to restaurants. They're, they're, they're traveling. You know, look at the airlines. Look at, the, you know, look at all the travel agencies. They're, they're booming right now. People are traveling all over the world. And you know, the baby boomers are spending your inheritance, guys. So we're going to leave a little bit for you, but we're going to enjoy it while we can. As you should, Bob. <laughs> Save me a little, Bob, please. All right, Aaron. Light trucks now account for 81% of retail unit auto sales here in the U.S. That's a 50% from like 10 years ago. I don't know what it is. Oil prices are higher, but man, oh man, Americans love their trucks. You know, I don't know what's going on. I have two young kids, so I would attribute it to that. But what, what happened to the minivan? You know, <laughs> these trucks are so expensive. They're killing you at the gas tank. They're killing you on insurance. And everybody wants, wants the big truck now. It's all I see on the road. Are you, uh, are you rocking a big truck or what do you got? No, I like the sedan. I like to be, to be low to the ground and not be able to put too much stuff in the car. But I mean, I don't know if it's these corporations monetizing you know, everything in the world to do with kids. The amount of stuff that you need to take with you or the places and activities that you need to take them to. I mean, it's insane. <laughs> so no, no Ford F-150 in your future? Put the kids in the back uh, bed not. there? I hope not. <laughs> Bob, the vibe session is real. <laughs> According to a recent Guardian survey, one in two Americans think stocks are down this year, which clearly they're not. Moreover, nearly three in five people believe the U.S. economy is pre presently in a recession. Notably, 55% think the economy is contracting, and 56% believe the U.S. is in a full-blown recession, even though U.S. GDP or economic growth has been up on an annualized basis for the last seven quarters. Man, oh man, um, you know, people that have a great feeling about the U.S. economy right now. You know, Rye, I, I know these people. I've had conversations with these people in the past. And, you know, hey, don't confuse me with facts, right? I have a feeling, right? <laughs> and so many people make investments based on I have a good feeling, I have a bad feeling. Um, you know what? You got you to look at the numbers and the numbers say we're in a big booming economy and we're in yeah. a big booming bull market. Well, in all fairness to me, if you look at actual energy prices and you look at food specifically, they still have outpaced wages over the course of the last three years or so. So you kind of understand where people are coming from and why people don't feel great right now. 
Um, but at the end of the day, I mean, the numbers don't lie. And, you know, if you look at purchasing power today versus 2019 before the pandemic, they're actually higher, even if we believe our lion eyes. So I don't know what to tell you. Maybe we're, maybe we're always just wired to be negative, like I said earlier. Hey, hope you enjoyed episode 163, Pain Points of Wealth. If you like our podcast, love our podcast, give us that five-star rating on Apple. It's on Spotify. You can give us a five-star rating as well. You can subscribe to our channel. If this is on YouTube right now, you can like this episode. Click that notification bell to be updated every week of our new content. Your support gives us the ability to continue doing this podcast. As always, stay loose and keep an open mind. Thanks for listening to The Pain Points of Wealth. Hopefully, you found the ideas discussed in this episode valuable and useful for your own financial journey. You can find out more about Bob, Ryan, and Chris's firm, Payne Capital Management, at BeBullish.com or through the contact information found in the description of this episode in your podcast player or app. Join us next week for another episode of The Pain Points of Wealth, brought to you by Payne Capital Management. Information provided on today's show is provided for informational purposes only and does not constitute investment, tax, or legal advice. Investment is obtained from sources that are deemed to be reliable, but their accuracy and completeness cannot be guaranteed. 